Photonics West is one of the largest events in the industry. There are many events that take place before and after the show. This morning, before the exhibition starts, we have the opportunity to talk with Frank Levinson. Frank Levinson was founder of Finizar, which he built into a multi-billion dollar optical components company. Frank is now venture partner at Phoenix Venture Partners and managing director of Small World Group Incubator. As a successful entrepreneur and investor, Frank shares tips and tricks and his views on the pitfalls, opportunities and challenges of raising capital. EPIC, the leading photonics industry association, has several hundred members. The majority of these companies are small and young, which is a reflection of the emerging photonics industry. A large portion of these companies have raised capital and several have been sold, resulting in a network of business angels. EPIC deals with investors, tracks mergers and acquisitions, and generally supports its members with finding money and supports investors with opportunities that match their priorities. Frank, thank you very much for welcoming us and to spend uh, some time with us to share your experience in entrepreneurship and investment. Could you tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, what you have been doing? Sure. Um, I got started in, in science and technology uh, by, by getting a PhD in astronomy, of all things, a long time ago. And after that, I went from there to Bell Labs and, and did fiber optics in, beginning in 1980. So that was my introduction to photonics. I remember when we interviewed there, uh, when I interviewed there, people said, uh, do you know anything about fiber optics? And I said, well, I think it starts with an F, because I, I didn't know anything. <laughs> they, they asked me questions about Star Trek and things like that, because I was an astronomer. But I, I loved it. It was, a, it was a field that was so young at the time. So anywhere you turned was, a, was an idea that could be new and, and powerful. Which year are we talking about? 1980. Okay. It was still all multi-mode fiber, but a year after that it changed to single mode and long wavelength. And Anyway, it was a very exciting time. And from there I, I, I left Bell Labs and stayed in New Jersey and started a company. And within a year was fired. And then came to the West Coast and joined a firm out here. And a few years later started a company called Finisar that uh, by that point I'd worked at a bunch of big companies and never finished anything. So I named my company after the word finished to remind myself, let's try to finish something this time. And uh, Finisar was a, a company where we got started uh, right away with sales. Our first month in business, we had $6,000 in sales. And uh, mainly we were selling services, just engineering services for others. But over the years, we turned the profits from that type of work into making some products that honestly initially weren't very good, but eventually they were, and uh, they got better, and, and uh, today Finisar is uh, the largest fiber optic component and subsystem builder in the world. And I was with them for 20 years, from 1988 when it was founded until uh, 2008. And then for the last 10 years I've been a venture capitalist investing in, in uh, photonic startups as well as material science. But now you are involved in some uh, investment uh, activities. Could you tell us a bit more about that? So around 2006 and seven and eight, when I was starting to leave Finisar, uh, I left day to day there in 2006. I left the board of directors in 2008. I uh, began investing in some small companies. Um, I invested in Vixar, which is a Vixel company out of, out of uh, Minnesota. I invested in Daylight Solutions, which was a, a mid-IR and quantum cascade laser company in uh, San Diego. And uh, both those companies have grown up. Uh, Vixar was, I mean, or Daylight was just bought for a, a large figure and did well. And Vixar's sales are growing nicely. So from that point forward, I began investing in companies because it was an area that I, I felt like I loved and, and knew some of the people and could see some of the trends. So. Uh, I've been now doing that for more than 10 years. So you have been investing in, in companies. Before you invest, I guess you, you look at many proposals. How many proposals have you seen in your life? Or do you see in a year? Do you see a lot of them? Oh, goodness, yes. The groups that I'm with, uh, Small World Group is, is my own vehicle where I invest in, in seed level things, which is sort of anywhere from $50,000 to 500000 maybe a million. And then Phoenix Venture Partners <coughs> is, a, is, a, is a Series A B fund where we invest anywhere from two to eight million dollars per company over time. And they both these groups focus on photonics and material science. Uh, so yeah, so last year Phoenix saw 
more than 400 uh, requests for funding, people that were you know, groups that we, we received a, a plan or a presentation on and so on, and we funded three. So we, we typically do less than 1% of the proposals we see. When you see all of that, is there a commonality, I would say, on what is uh, the good, the bad, the ugly? Uh, I, I'm, uh, what is, are there any pitfalls or, or things not so good that you, that you see in the proposals you get, or are they just like all very interesting and good, but they just don't match your, your areas of investment? So let me try to answer that question twice. Uh, we'll see if we can do it, because I have a couple of threads to do. The first thing is when we do the seed level investing, what we ask those groups to do is, is four things. It's to, to finish the product, sell it to some early customers in small quantities, at a good gross margin, meaning that there has, you can't make it for 100 and sell it for 50, like they do in, in, in Facebook and so on early on. You have to make it for 100 and sell it for 200, so there's really a profit. And then ideally, we want to have it sell um, again to those customers in bigger volumes. So if they bought five the first time, we'd like them to buy 500 eventually. So many engineers and entrepreneurs that come from the technology side think that the way a venture fails is the product fails to be developed. That never happens. Almost never happens. What happens is they, they, they build it, it works just like they hoped, Somebody does buy it that they've lined up from before we put the money in. They pay the price they said they would, which is a, a good gross margin, a good profit. But then they fail to buy to do the follow-on. And the reason is they get it and they think they're going to love it, but there's something they don't love. There's something about it that is a little different. And, and uh, then they want changes. And it may be that the changes can be made. Sometimes they can't. But the changes always take more money. And so sometimes little companies simply run out of money or they can't satisfy the customer to get it to scale. So we know today that the biggest failures we have over and over are, are do that. Now, how do, we, how do we try to react to that? And, and the way we do is we try to make sure that, that we take in plans where we think the market risk, the opportunity for this product to scale is as low as we can get. So. Um, if someone comes and, and they present us something that looks like absolute magic, but we're sure, wow, if we just had that, the world would really love it. But the technology risk, all of a sudden, then is much higher. To, to bring that magic is much higher. We take that risk because we very rarely see the technology fail. So we like to trade off technology risk. We like to raise the technology risk to lower the market risk. And, and so we look for plans like that. And are they well presented? I mean, in terms of sometimes I, I, I have heard there are good ideas, but they don't, they can't sell it properly. It's like the packaging isn't right when they present it to the investors. You know, we get presentations where they have 85 slides. They think they're going to show it to us in 20 minutes. And every single one of them is, is a technology slide. Clearly, I want to know that we're funding a business. You know, I seem like a nice guy. If I give you $10, I want $100 back. I don't want, I don't want $20 back. And the reason is we have a lot of failure. So with the success has to be really spectacular. And the success that you're going to have isn't going to happen over one year. So I don't give you 10 and you give me 20 back within a year. It may take, as in the case of Daylight Solutions that, that, that was bought last year, almost 11 years from the first funding. What, what is their expectation in terms of the, the amount of the return and the timing of the return? Is there a mismatch between what the, 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 the companies are asking for or expecting? Well, both sides think it's going to take shorter. And we're both wrong. <laughs> it always takes longer. But, but in general, the best entrepreneurs are ones that engage customers early. They find a way to get customer money to start flowing into them. And, and whether it's doing joint development agreements or having early products, where the product price is higher, but as the volumes grow, then the product can go down in, in price and so on. So things like that. In terms of the presentation, because you said 85 slides, maybe you may not like that, but I'm sure the investors are smart enough to go like, okay, maybe he's not able to make a good, good pitch, but you know, I, I'm, I, can, I can see through there the potential, or do you just like say, oh, I'll just put it on the side? There's some of that, for sure, where we just say, no, I can't, we can't, we can't repair this one. But for ones that we like, we'll often, the other thing is it's a myth about venture capital investing is that we, you know, some guys get together 
Uh, some folks get together in a, in a bar over a weekend, they draw some sketches on a napkin, they bring the sketches with a little PowerPoint dress up to a meeting on Monday morning and by Tuesday they have their money. Nothing could be further from the truth. We don't fund anything in shorter than three to six months. And, and we really get to know the people. This is, a, this is a people business and we want to understand well, how do these people perform under stress, how do they work together as a team and so on. So, and there's, you know, those are lots of ways things can fail. So, so we spend a lot of time getting to know them, getting to know the technology. What about the other ones? You really like the team. You're not convinced of, of the product, but you really like the team. Is there something you can do with that? or you'll Absolutely. Have to pass it oh. One of our very best companies today is a, is a group down in uh, Tucson. I probably shouldn't mention their name. But they were with another company and they came to present to us. And the three or two or three leaders of, that com of, the, modern, of the company we did fund were junior guys, but still in their 50s, but in this other company. We didn't gravitate at all to the CEO, CTO, and, and chairman that presented to us. So we said no. And these guys, these junior guys came back to us. Later, ha had left that company, said that didn't work, you know, but we have a new way of doing some things that we think would be of interest to you. And we said, we couldn't wait to talk to you guys again. You we liked. And we did invest in them. And it was terrific. And, it, and, and uh, we've been in with them a couple years. They just had their first big sale uh, of part of their business to somebody. We'll get, get all of our money back from that sale alone and, and then some. And they've got several more products in the pipeline. And, they, and the product they sold is just for one market segment and they'll sell it again. Well, you spend a lot of time um, when you see a potential, but it's not exactly what you'd want it, but you, you know, but you see potential. Will you spend time coaching them and working with them to try to work it out? Or you'll just say like, listen, come when you're ready. No, both. Sometimes we say, come when you're ready and here's the things we don't like. We, we always try to have the courage to say, these are the things we don't like. Because otherwise, we're not helping. Why did we take the meeting? Just to say no? And, and on the other hand, though, if we think there is something there, then we engage. And, and sometimes, um, you know, our investors in Phoenix are large corporations, mainly. And um, they don't invest with us. I mean, they, we can't embarrass them, we have to make money. But they invest with us to see ideas. They're so large that, they're, that that's their main purpose is to see ideas and, and so on. So, um, but oftentimes a company will come to us. So, for every, so for, for every hundred companies that come to us, we'll fund maybe only one. But we probably engage with 10. And of those 10, four or five, we literally introduce them to, to some of the big corporates that we know. Sometimes they get a joint development agreement. Um, some funding, some sales through, our, through the contacts we've done, uh, and uh, we don't even end up investing. So we, you know, we try to create a rich ecosystem where, where when we engage, you know, the guys that we deeply engage with, they get some benefit even if we can't invest. So the companies that they, who are in the, invest, in the investors, are they just in there for the money, they want to maximize the return, or do they sometimes look for other things than just a, a financial return? Why do companies invest? So, the companies invest with us because, for example, we keep a database of all the companies we see and, they can, and we open that up so they can look at it too. We have quarterly calls with these companies and we talk to them about, here's what we've seen since the last time we talked to you. Are these of interest? Yes. Well, can you hook me up with the CEO? Can you give me a presentation? Then we do that. So there's, there's many times that we do that. We didn't change our stock price by being great VCs and making them money that way. We changed our stock price by once every few years finding them one great idea that becomes a new product that they, that they take out to the broader field. This is a great uh, recognition the, that, uh, that they recognize that the innovation can come from small companies, so it's like a bit technology scouting. Oh, they know. They know. And, and so many companies today end up doing that. They, they buy technology. I mean, I, this is one of these, you know, secrets of modern times. Have a company or somebody has an ID, maybe a university, they have something going on, they have a, proto a product, a prototype, an ID. What is the first thing that they should do? But they need some money to get, get things going, to develop it or for the paying their salaries. What is their starting point? Talking to friends, talking with other, how, how would they get started? You know, the craziest thing is, the first thing they ought to try to do, remember, we've said this before already, they're starting a business. They, they can't they must avoid the modern trap of let's put up a website, let the world will come and find us. The right thing to do is go buy a meal for somebody that they think is going to be a customer. 
and just spend the whole meal talking to them. Here's the idea, what do you think? Well, that's really interesting, but I wish it was painted blue. Okay, write down, it should be blue. <laughs> but, but the idea is find some way to engage with customers and realize that what you're doing is creating a business, not making a technology that you love. That, that, that's part of it, but that's, but that's only part of it. Any tips and tricks once uh, the company, um, you know, uh, they don't have maybe so much experience in raising the capital, but they finally find somebody who is interested in what they want to do, they'd like to invest into it. Any tips, I mean, it's on the other side of what you're doing, but any tips and tricks for those companies uh, on how to maximize their benefit? Yes, that's a really good question. You know, it's easy to, to, to think of, there's all sorts of things when you start negotiating for, for money. You think, well, how much of the company am I going to hold on to? And how much is the, the vulture capitalist going to take from me? And that's the wrong way to do it. And, and sitting on the other side of the, you're going to do this deal once, maybe in your life. How often do I do it? Every day. <laughs> so it's an unfair negotiation in some ways. But more importantly, what you want to do is, and we have the same thing. We have no desire to do something unless it's going to be a partnership. We, we need to form a partnership with you. And that means however much of the company we take for our ownership, for the money we give you, it's got to seem ultimately fair to both of us. And the same thing has got to be true with you. You've got to think that's the case. So there's all sorts of terms in the term sheet that we talk about. There's percentage ownership and anti-dilution clauses and, and other things that, that come up. But, but in the end, the thing that all of us have to remember is we want to form something where we maximize the opportunity for success. If you give us 1% of your company and you hold on to 99%, how motivated will we be to help you? We put in the money, but are we going to really spend a lot of our time or whatever? Probably not. On the other hand, if, if we take 99% and you have 1%, you're not going to be motivated to work your heart out to stay late nights and, and, and invent and so on. So it's, it's that art of finding a way, because in the end, Nobody makes any money unless the company's a success. How will I recognize a good investor? They'll tell you things. They'll tell you things like I, I'm telling you. And most venture capitalists, surprisingly, I think, are. They, they, they're especially ones that have had more than one or two funds. If they raise one fund and go out of business, that maybe that was part of the problem. But if they've been around for a long time, they're they know that, they're, so that their bread is buttered by the, by the strength of that partnership they form. So I would recognize a, a good investor because I, there's also, I would feel comfortable with him. Yeah, so one of the challenges is too out there today, if you look at there, every country now is trying to have internal entrepreneurship. And the reason is, if you want to keep up in this world, the, the startup model, the venture capital model, is an accelerated model for, 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 for cultural growth, for just transforming a country. It doesn't matter first world, third world, it's the method. It's, it's by far more, more vigorous and, and fast acting than, than previous ones. And, and so there are people that are engaged. And, 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 uh, but on the other hand, there's also a lot of money. A lot of countries, even the poorest countries, have very wealthy people. And so, in the seed level funding, there's often a lot of money and, and friends and family and things like that and governments all contribute in to, to help their young people become good at the startup business. And, and in general, those aren't very good venture capitalists. They don't cut good deals. If it's friends and family, they often try to lavish money on them for not a proper valuation and so on. And the, and the kinds of friends and things that you want as a company, the big corporations and so on, those friends and families, they don't know those people like we do. So understand, you know, what you really want in a venture capitalist is someone who's going to give you more than money. They're going to do the money thing, but they're going to introduce you to people, they're going to, they're going to get in your corner and help fight for you technologically, they're going to help you in hiring, all sorts of things, and, and those are the, that's really where the value comes. So we're going to take a larger portion of your company than friends and family, but we're going to deliver more value. What do you think about these uh, awards and competitions uh, as a way to, to, to find investors? 
I think it's great. Um, and I, I do it, gosh, I don't know, at least once a month, all year. And I have been doing it at that, at that pace for a long time now. So, uh, yeah, I believe in it. And, uh, and I do some that are, that are more about social good, you know, impact investing it's called. So I, I do some that I don't ever tend to invest in as much as just try to help. But even then, I try not to, you know, they have the little judging columns and you put some numbers in and so on. But at the end, they always have comments. I always try to fill out the comments. So I try to give them, even then, feedback. So we had a good discussion, uh, which said uh, a bit that uh, I'm going to go back to a basic, basic uh, question. How do you recognize and find a good investor? First of all, a good investor for one company may not be the same as for someone else. Um, and so the first thing you have to do is be comfortable. On, on, on your side of the, of the equation, as the entrepreneur, you need to spend time with that investor. You need to go have dinners, just like he's a customer. In some sense, they're giving you money, so you need to understand. You need to say, you need to go potentially ask for him for references or her for references. Hey, can I introduce me to some CEOs of, uh, or CTOs of other companies you funded? I want to talk with them. I want to find out what they think of you. Um, and, and so on. So I'd say, it's, it's a, again, it's this two-way street. How do you find a, a good investor? That's the first thing. The second thing is I think it's important that they have experience in your sector. So in Small World in Phoenix, we focus on advanced materials, novel materials, and, and photonics. And in those areas, we think we're the best in the world. You know, if you, if you, you know, people say, well, how do you get here so much, get so much deal flow? The answer is, if you're doing a material science startup, you want to find us. And, and they do. Uh, same with photonics. So in general, it's, it's always comforting to talk to someone that, that, that's there. But if I can go one step back, even before that, maybe we skipped it because it was so obvious, but you know, how do I even meet these people? Do I go to Photonics Venture Forums? Do I just go to events which are related to investment? You can do some searching on the web and, 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 and do that. I mean, you can, there are lots of ways to, to do that. They're often in every community, at least in the U.S. and Europe, um, or nearby in, in large, larger cities. Um, there are angel groups that you can reach out to and talk to. There are accelerator, business accelerators or business incubators. Go there. They'll have open nights where you can go and talk to people and, and uh, other little startups there and sort of, sort of get to know the ecosystem where you live. And they'll know. They'll know. They'll have stories about good and bad investors and so on. What are the three tips that you would give to somebody who is out there who has a pro he's, he wants to raise money? Three tips, three pitfalls. Of all the mistakes that, of all the mistakes that you've seen, what is it that you say, like, please do fix this? Remember you're starting a business. What defines a business is customers. And long term, what defines a venture capital backed business or an entrepreneur type business is leveraged growth, high growth. You know, many businesses out there, if you're selling clothing or other things, growth of 10% a year is, is superb. But in high technology, the, the, the growth when you're a smaller company needs to be 30, 40, 50%, 100% a year and for several years or more in a row. And so the idea has, has to be big enough, it has to be received by customers with strong enthusiasm and follow on, and, and so that you can make a business that has sales and, and generates profits. That's what it's all about. At Epic, what we try to do is, uh, that's, uh, is to bring uh, the small companies together in touch with investors out of the hundreds of uh, member companies that we have. Several of them have actually sold their company, so we have a lot of business angels. The advantage is that they actually know the industry, they have been on the other side, so as an industry association we help do that matchmaking. So it's, it's a relevant audience, they understand the technology, the challenges through, so they kind of uh, match a bit uh, together. No, I think, you know, Epic's doing a great job, um, and I think it's been fun to, to attend some of their meetings and, and so on, and uh, I, I think it's, uh, it's the kind of gr industry standard group our industry group that really will help its members, you know, smaller companies, grow and, and, and thrive. And, and uh, congratulations on your success. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Frank. Absolutely. Thank you for your time. Thank you for sharing that experience. Sure. Thanks.